If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I will be doing topical Christmas sermons uh, this month, and then when we get back in January, we will start on the Beatitudes in Matthew, and we'll walk through the Beatitudes, and uh, I can't wait uh, for that to happen. I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas season. Uh, This weekend, uh, I put up my Christmas lights. I mentioned to Lori that I may not do that this year. And she said, I can give you one word of why you need to do it. And I said, okay, grandchildren. (laughs) All right. So we got them up. Uh, One set wasn't working. And the devil was working overtime on me on Friday. All right. (laughs) All right. So we're only human. Uh, But I, we got them up and I hope you will celebrate. Don't the decorations look beautiful? And in the foyer, they just look beautiful. Yeah, give them a hand. They've done a great job around here. The title of my sermon today is Finding Christmas Joy. Finding Christmas Joy. And I know what some of you are thinking. All that is going on in the world, all that is going on in the United States, all that is going on even in our state, and and you see all the negative publicity you can be gloomy and doomy and, you know, without hope if you listen to the news these days. But I got good news for you. Our God reigns. God is in control of every situation. And I'm asking you this month for us as Christians to celebrate the birth of Christ. Folks, I am telling you, he couldn't die on a cross unless he was born. So his birth, and not only that, which I'll be speaking of later, a virgin birth, something that the world has no clue about. Again, God can do anything. But today I want to talk about finding Christmas joy. If you have your bulletin and want to follow along with us, number one, living right. Okay, real simple outline, three points and two words in each point. All right, if you're going to find Christmas joy, you need to live right. Number two, right praying, living right, right praying, or praying right. And three, thinking right. Folks, we live in this negative society, and I have learned if I am going to have joy in my life, I need to see the good things in life and not point out all the negative things. I found this story, and I wrote down uh, the first time I read this, was in uh, 2011, but I wrote at the top of it a a true story. I don't remember what magazine it was in, uh, but it really drives home the point of what I want you to understand today. A woman was Christmas shopping with her two children. After many hours of walking down row after row of toys, and after hearing both her children asking for everything they saw on the many shelves, she finally made it to the store elevator with her two, two children in hand. She was feeling what so many of us feel during the holiday season, getting that perfect gift for every person on our shopping list, overwhelming pressure to go to every party, tasting all the holiday food and treats, making sure we don't forget anyone on our card list, and the pressure of making sure we respond to everyone who sends us a card. Finally, the elevator doors opened, revealing a huge crowd in there. She pushed her way in and dragged her two kids and all her bags of stuff with her. As the door closed, she couldn't take it anymore. She blurted out, whoever started this whole Christmas thing should be found, strung up, and shot. From the back of the elevator, a quiet voice said, don't worry, we've already crucified him. The rest of the trip was so quiet, you could have heard a pin drop. Folks, it is the birth of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important. There is nothing more important in your life than Jesus Christ himself. So I pray today as we look at God's word, it'll give you that Christmas joy. And it's not just Christmas joy. We as Christians should have joy all 365 days of the year. So let's look at living right. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, therefore means what, what, what is he talking about? Everything before this. And he's, he was talking in Philippians about being more like Christ. Folks, we need to be Christ-like in everything we do. And here he is talking to the church at Philippi. Notice how he describes them, beloved. Okay, he loves them deeply, long for. Okay, he, he started the church in Philippi, his second missionary journey, and it was the first church in the European region. So it was his, he had his stamps all over it. And, and he, he spent uh, time there laboring and getting workers and, and doing everything it takes to start a church. So this church was very special to the Apostle Paul. And then he says, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. My joy, he would think of them, and Paul addressed churches uh, in uh, the epistles, and, and he would say, my brethren in the faith. They had all these words. He had all these words for these churches that he started, and, and they were his joy. They were his crown, okay? They were his crown, and, and we will receive rewards in heaven for what we do for Christ. And the word there is stand fast. Folks, it's not time to quit. It's not time to give up. It's not time to throw in the towel. I believe our redemption draweth nigh. I believe if we're going to do something for Christ, we need to do it soon. So he admonishes them to stand fast in the Lord beloved. He used that phrase two times. And I believe in his writings, he is talking to the church as a whole. And then in verse 2, he gets straight to his point. I implore, and there's two ladies in the New Testament here that he mentions by name, and I cannot pronounce those names. I've tried them in a mirror, and I botch them. So we're going to call them Edna and Sally, okay? <laughs> I'm just a loose, a loose translation here, okay? I implore you, Edna and Sally, to be the same mind in the Lord, all right? I, you would either laugh at me when I pronounce them or laugh at that, okay? Either way, it was going to happen. But what I'm saying is, Paul is addressing these two women, and these women were prominent women in the church. These women were uh, ladies that he had done uh, uh, ministry with. They were probably uh, uh, saved under his ministry while he was there. So when he writes this, everybody in the church uh, knew who these two women are, and there was a problem. He doesn't say what the problem is, but if you get more than one person together, if you get two or more people together, there are going to be things we don't agree on. And here's the key, folks. We must learn to not be disagreeable to the point to where I'm not speaking to you, I'm not talking to you, I have nothing to say to you. We can disagree agreeably, all right? If I ask you, the best restaurant in town, do you know how many answers I'm going to get? And people even do this. They tell me, hey, have you went to the new place? It is great. And when I go there, I thought, it must have been an off day. <laughs> you think about it. Folks, everyone has a right to an opinion. But folks, it shouldn't split churches. It shouldn't cause hate and malice. It shouldn't, we, we shouldn't bring it into the church where, where, there, you know, where, where unity is a very, very important. Now, verse 3, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clementi, also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And he's saying, we need to address this issue. We need to take care of this. And folks, I am telling you, uh, we are human. 
We make mistakes. Nobody does the right thing every time. Only Jesus did that. But we cannot get our, make our differences a part, not only of the Christmas season, but all season long. And I got to thinking about that also. And I, I, I can give you another example of two godly spiritual men that had a difference. It's found in Acts chapter 15. We're not going to turn over there. But they were going on a second missionary journey. And it was Paul and Barnabas. And Paul told Barnabas, let's get things together and let's go on this journey. And then Barnabas said, I'm going to get John Mark to go with us. And Paul, I'm telling you, he got really upset about that. Why? Because John Mark, on the first missionary journey, quit. He went home. So Paul was not having anything to do with that. Okay? Paul, I believe, was filled with the Spirit. He wrote a third of the New Testament. Barnabas' name means minister of encouragement. But chapter, verse 39 says, the contention was so strong, they split way. Think of that. Think of all the ministries that they had done together. And folks, I am telling you, Satan divides, God unites. All right? And so, so what Barnabas did, he got someone else to go with. He, he took John Mark with him, and Paul went with Silas. You say, well, that's not a good deal. But do you realize that God still got something done? Instead of one mission team, he had two mission teams. So folks, there is a solution to every problem we have in life. And so that is just so important. And, and, we, and we're talking about these are strong Christians. These are biblical names. These are people that walk with the Lord and wrote part of the Bible. So we have to keep our guard up and do our best to get along with others. Matter of fact, uh, if you'll turn real quickly to Galatians chapter 6, Galatians 6, the Bible tells us in, well, let me find Galatians. There we go. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. He's talking about other Christians. And folks, it happens in churches. It happens in families. It happens at work. And we, during, not just during this Christmas season, we need to do our best to try to get along with all whom uh, we meet and with everyone that we work with and go to church with. Matter of fact, Ephesians, I think, says it bad. Ephesians chapter 4, go with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. And then he gives seven characteristics that Christians should have in their lives. With all lowliness. Christians, we need to be humble. We need to be humble. Two, gentleness. We need to be gentle. There's no reason to raise your voice. There's no reason. Even in sports, you know, you have coaches who will yell at you. And you, I even had coaches, uh, you know, in football and baseball that would curse at you. And folks, there's no reason. That's the, that's the language of the ignorant, folks. We need to use good words. The third characteristic is long-suffering or patient. Folks, we need to be patient with everyone. Everyone. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's our kids, our grandkids, other people's kids. All right? I see and, and walk through the gym and see kids running. You ought to see them on Wednesday night. Awanas and 70 kids in our gym. It is crazy. And one, it happened earlier in the year. One adult was in there and they just says, isn't this crazy? I said, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> Folks are going to be rowdy. Be patient, okay? Bearing one another in love is the fifth 
characteristic. Bearing one another is giving the other person the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the doubt. They, you know, don't doubt everything somebody said. If someone tries to apologize, don't say, you don't mean it. <laughs> All right? Now, I know I'm getting close to home here, folks, but I'm simply saying we need to be peacemakers, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. The, fifth, the sixth thing is endeavoring to keep unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and we need to be peaceful. So he gives you these seven characteristics, and here's the key. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in uh, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father all, of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Folks, during the Christmas season and at all times of the year, it would be like us going to, uh, you know, the Fridays, the crazy Fridays. I don't know how many of you went to Black Friday. And by the way, the blackest Friday there ever was was when we crucified our Lord. That was a Black Friday. But it would be as if you were in a store and there was one thing left in that store on sale. And it was two-thirds off. And two people get there at the same time. Do you know what the argument should be? Not over it. It ought to be, no, you take it. I insist, you take it. Wouldn't that be a better thing to do during Christmas season? Folks, we've got to put these things on 365 days of the year, living right. People see our words or hear our words and see our action. So not just living right, but praying right also. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Folks, rejoicing is an attitude of praise. I love the Christmas music. Now, I don't listen to it before it's Thanksgiving. All right, just a personal choice. But I am telling you, over the weekend, they started the Christian station, started playing Christmas music, and they're just something, Steve, about these hymns and the songs and the praises and what Jody has sung and what we're going to uh, sing all, all this month. Folks, it is rejoicing is an attitude of praise. Rejoicing is finding good in every situation of life. And even when you get bad news, bad news, you have to understand everything's going to be okay. Maybe life isn't the way you had planned it. Maybe you're on a detour right now. Maybe there's something traumatic that happened in your life. Folks, I am telling you, you can rejoice in all areas of your life. Let your gentleness be known to all men. And the Bible says, the Lord is at hand. Folks, we need to be the joyful. We need to be positive. We need to be encouragers. We need to, you know, implore people, hey, you know, think of some good things that are happening in your life. Now, here's where I wanted to get. Look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. You know what anxious is? Quit worrying. I'm telling we, you, we could start a club in this church, the Warriors. I had a lady tell me the other day, I went to visit her, and she, you know, she started telling me all this and all that was going on in her family and all this. And I said her name, I said, you are worrying way too much. I know, but that's the way God made, made me. And I had to say, no, the Bible says we should not worry. I don't have time to go over there, but why are we worried, you know, about, you know, uh, what, what, who we are or, or the clothes that we wear, or if we have enough food. And folks, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but Thursday and Friday, I, I, I messed up. I, I mean, I fell off the wagon. And I ate in the street while I was laying there, okay? <laughs> it, it was pitiful. 
It was pitiful. Now, I got a hold on it yesterday, okay? All right? But I'm simply saying, worry changes nothing. Okay? It's like that rocking chair that's on your porch and in your house. There's a lot of things going on, but you are going nowhere. Okay? And we need to quit worrying about things. It causes so many problems physically. Headaches, migraines, uh, uh, stomach issues, uh, there's blood pressure issues. All these things because of worry. So God is saying, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto to God. Folks, I believe with all my heart it, that happiness is a choice. You have to choose to be happy. You know, and, and I'm, I'm just being honest with you, folks. I don't do good around negative people. I'm thinking, does the sun ever rise at your house? Okay? Does it, are good things ever happening at your house? Folks, I want to be around people that have joy. And you have to understand, happiness is not joy. Happiness is happenstance or circumstances. As long as they are going good, you are happy. But folks, our Bible tells us to be joyful in everything. Find that positive note. Find that positive thread and weave it into somebody's life. So instead of worrying, what should we do? Folks, we should pray. We should pray. That's exactly what he's saying. And then he's talking about supplication. That's praying for others. Thanksgiving. That's one of the deals that Lori and I have just, I don't, I don't know, we just started it. You know, it, it was way before Thanksgiving. But we were just, more than anything, lately, we realized how much we have to be thankful for. For friends. For mine and Lori's relationship, for our children. And by the way, my son turns 41 today. I am getting old, okay? Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> we have so much to be thankful for. Now, here it is. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Jesus Christ. Everyone that is living and breathing, and many of them don't even know why, but they are seeking the peace of God in their life. Uh, folks, I've been on the other side of that coin. Before I was saved, I was an enemy of the cross. I was an enemy of God. And I was chasing the wind and just chasing things I had no business chasing, especially since I was raised in church. But when God got a hold of my life, folks, I have never felt so much peace is the day when I truly got saved. Folks, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So we need to chase and we need to Pray for the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Folks, I, I've done two kinds of fu funerals. Funerals for the saved and funerals for the lost. And those for the lost are the hardest ones for me to do. And mo already, they've already made their decision. So you just present the gospel and hope somebody else sees the light and gets saved. But when people that are saved get saved, I am telling you, uh, when Christians get saved, folks, it is a worship service. It is, hey, I, they're, they're, they've already gone. They're on, and they're in a better place. And that peace of God over, comes over us. Folks, death should not scare us. It's graduation day. I'm out of here. We'll see you later. I'm gone. Matter of fact, I've said this before. And somebody says something to me every time I say it, and I'm going to say it again. If I'm up here preaching my heart out, 
and I have a heart attack and I flop down, somebody finish the service and give an invitation. Okay? <laughs> I'm serious. He's gone. He's gone. And one or two are going to say, praise God, he's gone. <laughs> and folks, isn't that really? I'm serious about this. The peace of God is laying your head on your pillow at night and saying, I confess my sins, I'm right with God, and you just fall asleep. Folks, you're not going to solve the problems from 11 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning. Let it go. Let it go. Matthew chapter 6. You know this. You know this. But I want to go over it. Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, or I like to call it the model prayer. The model prayer. He's telling his disciples how to pray. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is praise. That is respect. Your kingdom come. It's coming, folks. Your will be done. Do you mean it? Do you mean it when you're praying, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Give us this day our daily bread. He does. He supplies all our needs. He f and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's not talking just about money, folks. We are in debt to Christ. His blood paid for our salvation. And, and do not lead us into temptation. Only Satan does that. God never tempt anybody with sin. But deliver us from the evil one. We need to pray for that. Folks, there's spiritual warfare, welfare, welfare, spiritual warfare going on every day of our lives. Be ready for battle. Realize, man, I know Satan has sent this person along. Why do you think that person at work hangs around your desk? Because you got an attitude at them. And until you get that straight, they are going to keep hanging around. God's tried to teach us a lesson. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. There is no stronger power than the power of God. Now verse 14 and 15, here's the key. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And folks, I could stop here and preach for another 45 minutes on forgiveness. Part of prayer, part of walking with God, Part of God answering your prayer has to do with how you handle forgiveness. You know what I found out? There are times in my life that somebody has done something wrong with me, and I'm the one up at night thinking about it and praying about it. And I do this. I don't know if you've done this before. You do something over, and, and then you ask for forgiveness, and then the next morning you're asking for forgiveness again, and you're asking for forgiveness again. Folks, if you were sincere the first time, God forgave you the first time. And folks, we need to forgive others. It keeps us from growing in the Lord. That's why he put it on the end of the Lord's prayer. Praying right. Forgiveness is the key to true peace. The true peace. So we see living right. We see praying right. And we see thinking right. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, what if, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He gives us seven things and characteristics that we need to to do in our prayer life. Folks, thinking right is so important in your life. If you're not thinking right, you will not be acting right or speaking right. These are characteristics that we need to have in 
our lives. And I'm telling you, these eight things should be the things that control our thinking and our praying. And your way of thinking strongly influences your actions. You think negative things, and I'm telling you, half the time, negative things are going to happen. But if you think positive things, if you look in the good in people, folks, I believe, uh, you know, you know we, we sometimes label people because they have made mistakes early in life. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Encourage them in the faith. And our thinking is so, so important. Look at verse 9. And the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Folks, I, I'll just be honest with you. I cannot stand before you and, and say like the Apostle Paul, just follow me and do what I do. You'll be in good shape. All right? I'm still working on it. And God's still working on you. Don't look at me so pious out there sitting there, okay? We're all working on things. But he's simply saying, be Christ-like in everything you do, in everything you say. You realize that there's a lost world out there, and they are watching Christians. They're trying to figure out what we are going to do and how we're going to react and what we are going to say. And Jesus never wavered in doctrine. Paul never wavered in doctrine. But folks, it's finding the good in people so that you can have a relationship with them and a friendship with them so, so that in, in, in over time you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. They would ask you a question like this, and this has happened to me. Why didn't you get mad about that? Well, why should I get mad about that? Folks, I am telling you, we are a blessed church. We are a blessed nation. And we need to let people know who we are in Jesus Christ. Look at the rest of that verse. And these do, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will give you the peace of God in your life. So thinking is so important. And folks, when we sin, we are not, I, you know what I call that? I call it stinking thinking. Man, that stinks. All right, sin will mess you up. Sin will hurt your reputation. Uh, sin will uh, cause you to backslide. Fill your mind with the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Pray being thankful and ask God to take these thoughts from you. Getting closer to God during Christmas should be a goal of every Christian's life. My last verse, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10. It's talking about thinking here. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 speaks of that. Now here it is. Casting down argument and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You know what I found out about an argument? You can't have one if you're not participating in it. Some people just want to argue with you. Some people just want to tick you off. Some people just want to make you mad. All right? So don't give them, don't give that to them. Folks, it takes two to argue. Now here it is. Bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Folks, I believe in, with all my heart, this is the biggest challenge that a Christian has in their life. And I'm talking about Christians bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Folks, you can't do that without the mind of Christ. And I understand, you know, Jesus' mind was pure, it was holy, but folks, that ought to be something we strive for. So, 
How is your joy as we start the Christmas season? Do you really have the joy of the Lord? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? My challenge to all Christians is to show the joy of the Lord to everyone this Christmas season. And folks, then it's all wrapped up in love. Jesus loved everyone he came in contact with. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your word. God, it is yes, it is amen, it is true, it is holy. And God, I pray that we would change our way of thinking, God. I pray that we would put you first in our lives. God, I pray this Christmas season, we make a commitment today, today, to be Christians with joy in their hearts and on their tongues. God, I thank you for the Christmas season and Christmas music. And God, I pray we take every opportunity that we can to share with others what the true meaning of Christmas is. It's the birth of a king. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. They can experience the joy of being saved. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I know there's folks here in dire strait. It's, it's finances, sometimes it's marriage and other things. But God, I pray that they would just put those thoughts aside right now and they would commit to you to be joyful this season. God, help them. Lord, help them to influence others and be positive and loving towards others. God, even in what we do in giving gifts, God, I pray that we would find someone who truly is struggling, struggling in life. And God, I pray we would bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?